Craving the perfect holiday snack? Check out Farmer Bill's Biltonk. Think beef jerky, but better. No sugar, no preservatives, just pure animal protein goodness. Crafted from premium grass-fed beef or bison and air-dried to perfection, Farmer Bill's Biltong is nutrient-packed, energy-dense, and perfect for an on-the-go treat or a standout snack for your next party. My favorite is the original bison, but the other flavors like the original beef, smokehouse, and spicy chili have me second-guessing that choice more than once. Visit FarmerBillsProvisions.com to grab a one-pound slab or a variety pack and use code BIZBIT10 for 10% off. Farmer Bills Biltong, don't be the two-liter guy at this year's Christmas party. I think a lot of people are fed up with their traditional health care system. You know, they feel like a number. I mean, it really, it's a sick care system. It's not a health care system. Let's just be really direct about that. And I think there's a whole new generation of people who, A, they don't want to just, they don't want a doctor who thinks he's God, who's going to just tell them what to do. They want someone to collaborate with them and provide them with, you know, education and, and support them in staying healthy. Welcome to the Business Bitcoinization Show, the show dedicated to helping you enrich your life and grow your business with Bitcoin, the hardest money on planet Earth. I'm your host, Josh Friedemann, and our guest today is Veronica Max, who's a mother of four, homesteader, nurse practitioner, and founder of Ultra Personal Healthcare, a holistic concierge medicine and health optimization practice with locations in Austin and Dripping Springs, Texas. She values the sovereignty of the individual and recently started accepting Bitcoin as a form of payment in her practice. Today's conversation doesn't focus on Bitcoin as much as it does health optimization, but I think you'll enjoy the conversation. And certainly if you want to skip ahead towards the end of the interview, you can hear a little bit about how she accepts it in her practice. Of course, before we get to the conversation, we do have this week's Bitcoin Meetup Spotlight. And even before that, I want to give a shout out to some of the people who have been supporting the podcast by listening on Fountain in the last week. First of all, those who have been streaming sats to the podcast. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this first name, but I'm going to say Zoresme and No Waste BTC Signs. Thank you for streaming sats to the podcast. And for those who have boosted as well, One Rational Man sent 98 sats. Piez also sent 98 sats and said, thank you, sir. And finally, Tor Pottle sent 210 sats and said, Great stuff. Please try and connect with Hunter Hastings for a future podcast. And Torb Hoddle, just because of you, I connected with Hunter. And I think we're going to be doing a podcast swap in the not too distant future. It's a little outside the purview of this podcast, but Hunter's going to be able to talk about business and Austrian economics. And if you want to check out his podcast, it's called Value Creators. And speaking of value creators, if this podcast creates value for your life, I encourage you to listen on the Fountain app where you can either stream sats as you listen or you can send a boost with a comment. It's always great to get that feedback and also recommendations for future guests. Now, this week's Bitcoin Meetup Spotlight is the Austin Bitcoin Club, which Veronica actually just shared at last week, along with Andy Schoonover of Crowd Health, who we interviewed in the very early days of this podcast. The Austin Bitcoin Club, like Bitcoin, is for everyone. They host multiple meetings every month for Bitcoiners from all walks of life. Their main meeting is on the first Thursday of the month at the Bitcoin Commons. They also host both morning and evening gatherings every Tuesday at the Meteor. Their intention is to educate and grow alongside the community one orange pill at a time. You can find them on Twitter at AustinBTCClub or on their website, AustinBitcoinClub.com. Those links are down below, along with a link to the Oshi app, which you can use to find a Bitcoin meetup near you. Now, we're going to get to our interview with Veronica right after this. Business owners, unlock the benefits Bitcoin has to offer your business with the Bitcoin for Business Quick Start Guide. This 27-page guide highlights the six ways you can grow your business with Bitcoin. Check it out in the show notes. Veronica, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Josh. Great to be here. So I like to start off every single interview with a few questions that help us to get to know you a little bit better and give us some insight for our own lives. Are you ready for these? I'm ready. I think they'll give me away as a Bitcoin novice. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) First of all, when and how did you first learn about Bitcoin? 
That's a great question. I was thinking about that one uh, earlier, looking at your questions. But uh, I th- want to say the first time I heard about it with my brother was doing some, in, you know, uh, speculation uh, in Bitcoin. Uh, I don't know, uh, not too long after 10, 15 years ago, something like that. Um, and so that was probably, you know, I, I think he lost quite a bit of money doing that. Um <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was my first, kind of, I think, um, introduction to it. And then kind of what was it that that kind of finally got you interested in Bitcoin? Because a lot of times you have that first touch point and maybe you have the, you know, the first 10 touch points. But at some yeah. point, something stands out to you. Was there a moment like that for you as well? Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of been in the background for many years. Um, you know, I married, my husband's kind of uh, is involved in most of the financial stuff. But I would say it probably follows um, the line of my emotional development. And, um, you know, with, uh, you know, doing my own emotional work and trauma work and learning to come home to myself as an individual, um, you know, that led me to an interest in, um, uh, you know, by taking personal radical personal responsibility for myself and wanting sovereignty over myself, you know, over my children, education, our food. Um, and I think that probably escalated quite a bit with COVID, you know, and uh, my husband and I moving out on land, um, starting this business, um, you know, and so I think that it's just the sovereignty piece is when that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, it it just made sense that, you know, I've, I'm very much about sovereignty and healthcare. Um, we're about sovereignty and um, food, um, sovereignty and education. And the last piece for me, um, where John, you know, um, John Gordon from Crowd Health had introduced me to um, to the idea of accepting Bitcoin and the practice. And so that's where it's like, oh, yeah, this just really makes sense based on my values and principles. I don't know why I haven't uh, done this already. It's really more of a probably a tech tech thing. And I'm just a um, lagging adapter adopter. I guess I'm an early adopter in the healthcare yeah, space, but for sure. So next question is this. What's an insight or fact about Bitcoin that you wish everyone understood? Great question. Uh, insight or fact. <clears throat> hmm. For the layperson, um, you know, no government controls uh, controls Bitcoin. I mean, it truly is a decentralized and um, sovereign form of of money, and um, and I think people are starting to learn the importance of that. What's the Bitcoin resource that you most recommend to other people? This is where I said I'm gonna sh- I'm going to uh, highlight myself as a Bitcoin novice. Uh, that would probably be you know John took me through a whole series of um, education uh, prior to you know me starting making the decision to accept Bitcoin in my practice. And so I don't I can't say that I have my own resource at this point. Um, but he he provided me with the education, so it's probably my slide deck that I have from him. <laughs> It's great to have someone in your life who can really sit down with you and, you know, walk you through through things. Not everyone has access to that. So definitely, no. definitely a valuable thing, especially if it's someone who's a Bitcoiner, because sometimes you get that initial contact. Someone's talking to you about all these things that crypto can do. But get someone who can really explain to you Bitcoin for the first time is super valuable. Right. And we're talking about John Gordon and he's uh, yeah. he now you know was consulting with me as a healthcare practice and, you know, getting me up to speed on Bitcoin and, you know, um, and how to accept it and helping me troubleshoot that. So now we have question number four, kind of moving outside of Bitcoin. So in yeah. case that helps you to feel a little more comfortable yes, beyond Bitcoin, <laughs> what, what is a resource tool or idea that's been helpful to you or your business recently? It's a great, you know, I think for me, the biggest thing, my um, it's just it's literally it's asking for help. I'm a mother for, I'm an entrepreneur. I started my first business in 2013. Uh, uh, Again, I live on 50 acres. There's a lot on my plate. Um, and I don't know. And I think this is this is something that I see interacting with many women and just people in general. But it's always been uh, it's been very difficult for me. And that, talking about emotional journey to ask for help. You know, there's just been this idea that I need to do it all myself. I'm a very hard worker. Just put my hair, head down and go, go, go. Um, but it's the idea that it's OK to ask for help. And that, in fact, um, when you ask people are generally more than happy to help you and it makes them feel good to help you. Um, So I think uh, that's probably uh, it more than anything. Uh, At this point in my life and career, it's less about knowledge and um, tech per se and more about my emotional growth. 
And now we have our final, what we call our arbitrary but insightful question, and it's this. Mm -hmm. As a general life principle, is it better to ask why or why not? I'm going to go with it's better to ask why. You know, um, understanding the the reason behind something, you know, I often get into this with um, with patients, you know, talking about, for instance, um, uh, the importance of sun exposure and um, take someone I was talking to the guy yesterday the other day with elevated cholesterol and I gave him the information as to, well, you know, um, it's sun exposure through contact with the skin, LDL cholesterol with sun exposures converted to vitamin D. And once he understood that, he understood the reason that, it, you know, he needed to get outside more often and how that was so mm-hmm. essential to his health. And so um, I think that's why I'm choosing to go with why, although why not? I could see many arguments for that too. Um, but I really like giving, you know, for myself, knowing the why, and then also um, when I'm working with people, giving them the rationale for why are we doing something this way? Excellent. Well, you mentioning the sun exposure thing, I'm looking out my window right now. Every day I'm getting out there and um, I have a certain goal when it comes to, to jump rope, which we don't need to get into right now, but really it's interesting. direct sunlight every, every single day. And and uh, it's been really good. I have one of those high cholesterol diets. I haven't actually, mm-hmm. I, I haven't checked my own cholesterol, but I, I definitely see the value of uh, yeah, I need a high cholesterol vitamin. diet too. The whole diet cholesterol hypothesis is bunk. So uh, yeah, you're not going to be scalded by me about that. Meet Linkster, your premier Bitcoin focused advisor. Linkster caters to businesses, institutions, family offices, and high net worth individuals. They merge your unique financial goals and needs with Linkster's Bitcoin expertise to craft your own sustainable plan to preserve and grow the value of your hard earned profits and retained earnings. At Linkster, it's not just advice, it's tailored execution. Connect directly with the founder by visiting linkster.com. That's L Y N C S T E R. Dot com Linkster. Secure your future with Bitcoin. Today's episode of Business Bitcoinization is proudly brought to you by Velis Commerce, where the future of business technology meets Bitcoin. As we journey through the era of Bitcoin and its transformational impact on businesses, there's one name that stands out. Velis Commerce. Whether you're looking to build a cutting edge website, a seamless mobile app, or custom software, Velis is your go to team. They've been diving deep into the world of Bitcoin since 2014, making them one of the most experienced groups for integrating Bitcoin and Lightning payments into a variety of digital platforms. But here's what truly sets them apart Velis Commerce doesn't just build, they bring a wealth of knowledge to ensure your project success from day one. Their team understands the nuances of Bitcoin, ensuring that your business stays ahead of the curve. And for all business Bitcoinization listeners out there, Velis Commerce is offering a free consultation to kickstart your project the right way. So if you're ready to future proof your business in the coming age of hyper Bitcoinization, head over to VelisCommerce.com or reach out on Twitter at Velis Commerce. Let's make Make sure your business thrives in the Bitcoin era. Yeah, no, no it's just it, it's amazing how our bodies work together and the things we've been told so often. I'm sure we're going to go into this in yeah. just a second, but so many things that we think are true just aren't so. Mm-hmm. That's a segue. Uh, I'll, I liked I liked you talking about the sunlight thing because that's something that I've been trying to really focus on a lot recently. And in addition to you know moving and things like that, but uh, today we're here to talk about you and your business, uh, Ultra Personal Healthcare. And yes. uh, like you said, John Gordon uh, was a connecting point for us. It sounds like he's been instrumental in your understanding of and implementation of Bitcoin in your business. And and I do want to hear about that, but it's also interesting just hearing about what you're doing as far as healthcare goes. So could you share with us about your business, why you started it, and then we'll get into the Bitcoin stuff later. Yeah, so I've been in healthcare since 2010, started as a nurse, then became a nurse practitioner, and um, started my first business in 2013, uh, and then uh, started Ultra Personal Healthcare in 2019. And basically what we are is a concierge primary care practice, but we focus on health optimization, we take a very holistic approach to healthcare, and um, I very much believe in the sovereignty of the individual. So um, what that means is... I view it as my job to provide my patients with education on the risk and benefits of any medical intervention or test or procedure, and then that it's up to my patients to decide what's best for them. I find that all too often in healthcare, you'll find this paternalistic um, kind of approach where the, you know, the doctor could be a nurse practitioner, PA, 
uh, views themselves as the expert and um, that they know better about you and um, what's best for you, your body than you do. Um, and uh, I just uh, kind of throw that out the window. I don't agree with that uh, model. And I take a much more collaborative approach with my patients and um, really view my job as a guide and an, an edu- educator. Um, Sure, you pay me just as you would as an accountant to stay up to date on all things health and wellness. Um, But ultimately, it's up to you to decide what will work for you and what won't. Um, And that includes everything across the gamut, you know, uh, from vaccines to tests that you want to perform or screening procedures. So when I saw the term concierge medicine in your bio, it immediately made me think of Royal Pains, the TV show. I don't know if you've heard of that. Have you you ever watched that in the past? (laughs) I I am pop culture uh, media. Uh, I'm a bit ignorant when it comes to that okay. stuff. So I've heard of it, but I have not seen it. No. So I actually really enjoyed the show. Uh, I'm sure it's not realistic, but the whole premise there is that, you know, he, he goes and is the, the doctor for particular people, goes to their homes. When you say concierge, are you talking about going to people or is it still uh, people coming to you and then you let them kind of decide what is best for them, like you would just explain to us? That's a great question. If you're willing to pay more money, we'll come to you. We do have a um, premium uh, level of membership, which is the exact same as our um, normal membership, which is $125 a month for adults, $60 a month from children. But if you want us to come to your home, uh, then that's our premium membership, which is $10,000 a year. Um, and so that's literally the only difference. Um, it's more, you know, for those people who, um, I guess value their time more than their money. Um, and so, but the concierge model really just means that rather than using your health insurance, you are going to pay me directly for your health care. And so there's no intermediary. There's no middleman there. I'm responsible to, to you and not to your insurance company. Mm-hmm. And as you can imagine, that really changes the incentives. Obviously, we've briefly talked about crowd health in this podcast. Mm-hmm. Then there's what you're doing. Is there is this something that is popular in Austin or maybe more popular than average? Or does it just so happen that your business, ultra personal health care and mm-hmm. crowd health are in the same area? Yeah, no, these um, I think these things are pretty popular in Austin, but they're gaining popular popularity across um, the country. You know, um, I think a lot of people are fed up with their traditional um, uh, health care system. Um, you know, they feel like a number, they, um, I mean, it really, it's a sick care system. It's not a healthcare system. Let's just be really direct about that. And I think there's a whole new generation of people who, um, a, they don't want to just, they don't want a doctor who thinks he's God, who's going to just tell them what to do. They want, um, someone to collaborate with them and provide them with, you know, education and, and support them in um, in staying healthy, you know, with with information, whether that's you know um, you know advanced genetic testing or micronutrient panels, or you know all of these um, advanced uh, information and tests that we have available to us now. They want to use this stuff to be able to stay healthy, not just um, uh, be treated once they're sick, right? And they want someone to partner with them to do that. And so you can't really do that within the um, insurance paradigm because insurance does not re- the insurance only reimburses if I can code disease. And when I'm, you know, treating someone who's perfectly healthy, you know, by by their standards, I can't code disease. There's, they're not going to pay me to spend an hour with someone looking at, hey, yeah, all of your labs are normal, but you know, they're not optimal. And here's the places where they're not optimal. Here's the places for for work that can be done. And, and most of what I'm talking about, these are lifestyle interventions, these are get more sun exposure, Uh, you know, eat local, you know, food, meat, fish, veggies, uh, you know, move, get outside, get your hands in the dirt. Um, things like that. And so crowd health, by the way, is open before it. Sorry, just one last thought with that. So, um, so basically, my my practice, for instance, and, and other models like mine, 
provide um, what I call routine, uh, they feel your routine healthcare needs. So your wellness exams, your sick visits, your, you know, for women, pap smears, well child checks, things like that. Um, what most people utilize healthcare for 99% of the time, right? And then crowd health, um, you know, covers those catastrophic needs. So you get hit by a bus, you get cancer, you need to go to the hospital for something. And so the two marry well, uh, very well together for a f- to get comprehensive healthcare coverage. So you've already talked a little bit in the last answer in the last couple of minutes about health optimization. I want to talk about Mm -hmm. that in just a second. But the other thing I wanted to ask, as you had described your model, is would you describe this as direct primary care? Is direct primary care similar but different? Is this a subset of direct primary care? What's that relationship? Great question. I just uh, actually wrote a blog post about this. Um, But basically, I would I would consider my model. So concierge really uh, just means that you are directly employing your physician. There's no insurance involved. You're paying whether it's a monthly or an annual membership fee and that um, there will be some variance in what is included in, in that. In my model, that includes unlimited memberships, you know, relaxed appointments, the ability to directly text and call your healthcare provider, um, televisits, um, you know, all of the things that make healthcare convenient, an annual basic set of labs, etc. That that exactly what's included can vary. But the 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 at its core level, it's just that you have a direct relationship with your healthcare provider. Um, the d- direct primary care model is kind of a subset of concierge. It's g- mm-hmm. generally um, I think it kind of evolved to make healthcare more or concierge medicine more affordable. So it's rates on par with, you know, like I said, my rates are $125 a month for adults, uh, $60 a month for children. You know, that's really reasonable for personalized um, healthcare from being able to just, you know, directly text your healthcare provider and get in, you know, same day or next day to see to see your doctor. So that's really, um, you know, they're similar. Concierge is typically more expensive, but I would say direct primary care, care falls within underneath the concierge um, umbrella. I typically, I just don't use that name because a lot of consumers still, they're not aware of what that is, right? Um, but if you're interested in a model like mine and you're not in Texas, um, you know, you can go search direct primary care near me and you can probably find a provider that is doing something similar to what I'm doing. They don't necessarily share my um, values for sovereignty or for um, holistic uh, medicine and health optimization, but they you should be able to find someone who's providing this, um, this model, which generally you're going to get a much better um, customer experience and much more personalized care simply and that's because when you're not accepting insurance the doctor can you know maybe they have a panel of 500 patients as opposed to the average of 2500 patients when you're accepting insurance yeah so i i think that even if someone does not have the same views as you have uh, aren't mm-hmm. as focused on sovereignty the reason they're taking a different approach to medicine is because they were dissatisfied in some way. And so I feel like mm-hmm. you at least have someone who's further along that path, maybe than a lot of doctors who see nothing wrong with the current system. I know we have a Correct. couple DPCs in our area. Um, mm-hmm. I don't currently have a relationship with them, but it does seem like they'd be great people to have conversations with about Bitcoin. And, you know, we're going to talk about Bitcoin at some point on this podcast. I, I love this, the, the direction this interview is going, though. And I like to turn to health optimization a little bit right now, if we could, just to maybe pick up some insights or thoughts from you, whether it's things that someone might want to ask for from their physician or mm-hmm. uh, general health practices, whatever you might have that you think are, are the most important things for people to be considering when it comes to optimizing their health. Yeah, I think um, number one, you know, understanding when you are going into and I think maybe that's a good blog post that I should um, write, but like what labs to do um, for just a routine physical, because what you're going to get from, you know, most primary care physicians is pretty limited. Um, What I'm running is a bit more extensive and what I consider my basic panel, you know, um, for instance, I don't just look at a fasting blood sugar and a hemoglobin A1C, which is a three month average of your blood sugars. When I'm assessing metabolic health, um, you know, that's what most doctors are looking at, just a hemoglobin A1C and a um, and a fasting blood sugar. I also look at an insulin level. Why do I look at an insulin level? So insulin is that compound that helps uh, glucose or sugar get into the cell. 
And we see elevations in insulin several years before we ever see elevations in blood sugar. So I'm checking an insulin level because I want to catch things before they develop, you know, uh, turn into overt disease, right? So that's why I'm checking an insulin level. Most doctors aren't checking that. So if the insulin's elevated, but your blood uh, sugar is normal, I know that we've got a problem brewing. Um, leptin would be another one that I routinely check. Leptin is a master, it's kind of your master hormone. Um, it's made in your fat cells and, uh, it tells, tells your, communicates with your brain to tell your brain, Hey, we've got enough energy on board. Um, stop eating. So it controls satiety or, uh, we need more energy. You know, we're starving here. We need some more energy to run uh, the metabolic processes. So we need you to eat. And what we see, so this isn't even, uh, insulin's an earlier indicator than blood sugar, but even before that, leptin uh, leptin signaling will go wrong. So uh, leptin's even further upstream. And so what happens is people avoid, you know, they they overeat, um, they don't get enough sun because sun's also involved in this pathway and their leptin will be off. And these are things that we can fix really easily. So that, you know, let's talk about what are things that you can, um, what are things that you can do or just basic health principles that sh- people should know for um, health optimization. I think, you know, the most important thing, it, you know, used to it for me, it used to be nutrition, but the more reading I do in um, quantum biology and circadian biology um, and understanding the importance of the sun. Not, and there's two sides of that coin, right? There's getting enough sun exposure during the day on naked eyes. That means, you know, no contacts, no, no sunglasses, no glasses. So naked eyes um, and as much body surface area as possible. So, I, you know, I tell people, I joke, you know, I really design my life now so I can spend as much time as possible on my land naked and barefoot. Um, and you know, not only does that feel really good, but there's a reason that feels really good, you know, cause I'm outside in the sun and just soaking that in. Um, you know, the other thing would be, um, you know, sleep's incredibly important of course. Oh, sorry. Uh, two sides. So enough sun during the day and then complete darkness at night. And that's mm-hmm. where we see this causes so many problems. How many people have trouble sleeping? Um, and, and, and are they on screens, you know, after dark, are they outside at all in the first thing in the morning? Because it's that morning, uh, you know, seeing the sun around sunrise that triggers the brain to produce melatonin later in the day. And then by the way, when you're on a screen or in front of these, you know, I've got these led lights on in front of me, um, that blue light hits the back of your retina and, and turns off, um, you know, suppresses melatonin. So that's not a good thing to happen, right? At 6, 7 p.m. at night when you're trying to get ready to go to sleep. Um, So I I think the number one thing that people need to be focusing on is light environment. Because there's there's even, and just to say one more thing about that, there are a lot of studies on artificial light at night and obesity and, um, and diabetes. And basically... Artificial light at night increases your cortisol, which increases increases your insulin and your blood sugar. And so you can develop diabetes, you can get um, get fat w- without even the discussion of food, just based on light alone. Very interesting. So the, 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 there's a question, I don't quite know the way to formulate it, but one thing I've noticed is that there'll be these, these things that people talk about, kind of like on the edges of of medicine mm-hmm. or science that end up, mm-hmm. you know, seem, um, they're, they're new. You've never heard them before. They may or may not sound kooky, but you don't mm-hmm. really necessarily buy into them early on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they end up becoming kind of mainstream things. I'm sort of curious about, first of all, what's something on the horizon that seems kooky, but you think is legit. And then mm-hmm. something, and I say kooky, but it just, it's not mainstream yet. I, and then, I then something, yeah, then, then something that's kind of on the horizon that you think might end up being bogus. Do you have any thoughts on those types of things? Because a lot of times oh. it seems like Bitcoiners especially want to be on the, the cutting edge. Sometimes mm-hmm. the cutting edge is where you find the the best stuff. And sometimes you find stuff that ends up not being true. Right. Uh, I mean, I think the, uh, non-native EMF is something that's on the horizon that's going to be, that's going to that seems a little kooky to a lot of people right now. I thought even just a couple of years ago uh, myself that it was kooky. Uh, <laughs> there's a, a lot of evidence that non-native EMF is really, really, really 
bad for our health. I mean, we so are. So this earpiece I have right here, this type of thing. Yeah, yeah, that Bluetooth thing that you've got in your ears, not so good. You might want to get some wired headphones um, oh. for for health optimization. Get a little. It's just so uh, much more convenient. I, I, I'm, I'm glad you're saying this, but. Uh... I know a lot of people, and and that's, and this is the hard thing with it. People don't want it to be true, right? Because we're addicted to our technology, but we are, we're not just, you know, medicine and science and we've, we viewed the, the, the human body as this biochemical thing, right? Almost like a machine, but we're actually, we're energetic beings, I mean, we use the the light photons from the light of the sun to make energy. And so this and these non-native EMFs, I think it's going to be so big, just like when cigarettes, right? You know, everybody used to smoke mm-hmm. and then we realized that cigarettes cause cancer. We're going to realize 20 to 30 years down the road. Oh, crap. Uh, all these 5G towers that we have around. Oh, that's why people have all these brain tumors. Mm. That's a little scary. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's helpful for me to know. I won't change the the earbuds to the corded ones right by my side right now because that might mess up the recording. But I, I appreciate you letting me know that. <laughs> I'll what about something you, that's yeah. <laughs> what about something that's that's kooky on the or this it's on this on the horizon that seems a little kooky that will end up being kooky. Um, you know, and that's, a little more, s- that's a little more difficult because you know it, what it if is. you end up being wrong. But I'm just kind of curious to know what things are looking like from your perspective now. I mean, I want to say something along the lines of, you know, all these longevity people. Um, I went to a longevity conference in in New York City back in 2013, and it was just so fascinating to me that I looked around the room and all these people that were it was was a singularity conference or something that were that were obsessed with living forever. And then you look at them and they were so clearly unhealthy. They weren't even getting the basics right. And so I think um, it's things... uh, you know, like maybe rapamycin or something like that, which is one of these drugs that's, um, that's really touted for longevity. Um, it, uh, I think maybe not that it doesn't work, but that there are better and safer ways to achieve what rapamycin achieves, such as, um, a ketogenic diet and fasting. You'll get the same results, uh, cause it's having the same chemical effect in the body. Um, but it's, it's not a drug. You're triggering these things naturally. And in fact, um, our bodies were, you know, we were intended to be in ketosis for periods of time and to fast for periods of time. Hmm. Well, you won't have to convince me that doing the more natural thing is always, or at least almost always, if not always better than doing mm-hmm. something that is somehow drug induced. Now I do yeah. want to, before we finish up the interview today, turn quickly to Bitcoin, uh, how you're using it in your business and sort of what your experience has been so far mm-hmm. with that, as well as any tips that you might have for business owners who are getting started Great. using mm-hmm. Bitcoin in their business. Yeah. So, um, I charge monthly membership fees. So, you know, it's, pretty easy use case. Um, Just telling our patients that, hey, if you'd like to pay in Bitcoin, we now have this as an option. Um, There's definitely some um, some obstacles to that, because, of course, I use invoicing software. I have a software that's specifically for, you know, concierge practices. Um, They're not terribly interested in integrating the API, probably because there's not a huge demand right now. Um, also they're not te- terribly, they're, they're based in San Francisco and I wouldn't say they're terribly sovereign minded either. So, uh, it's a bit of a manual process at the moment, um, trying to get the different things to work together, but it's something that's so totally doable and something that I'm willing to go, you know, do a little extra work, um, to make it work. But we're using ZapRite um, as our solution for, for invoicing because one of the things that we ran into and with some of the other platforms is, um, which is a benefit of Bitcoin, right, which is that it's anonymous, but I need to know who's paid me, right, so that I can, um, so that my books are straight. Um, sure. So ZapRite ena- enabled, uh, enables us to do that. So that's what I'm using currently. Um, and we're using it for membership um, payments, um, you know, anything else that's charged through our business. So sometimes, um, you know, if patients want labs, they can pay for those through us. We have special wholesale pricing. So anything that would go through us, you can pay in Bitcoin or you can pay, you know, with fiat, um, fiat currency as well. 
Um, so it's actually been pretty easy to implement once I understood exactly what Bitcoin was and the different software and technology um, that was mm -hmm. available to us right now. And John, of course, you know, made that learning curve faster. Yeah. But um, but really, at su surprisingly, it seemed more intimidating at first. And then, you know, once I sure. it's like, oh, ZapRite's just normal in, you know, um, invoicing software. It just enables this. It's on Lightning and enables um, enables uh, you know payments via Bitcoin or card or ACH, whatever you want to do. So then, a quick question here, and this may be something that's developing as time goes on. But do you plan to just hold that or do you plan to turn that back into USD for operating expenses? Or what was your thought question. when it comes to the Bitcoin you do receive? Yeah, so right now, I'm just holding it. Um, you know, that may change as I might need to reevaluate that, you know, um, looking at cash flow, and, you know, operating expenses in the future. Right now, it's a pretty small portion of our, um, you know, patient panel that is paying mm -hmm. in Bitcoin. Um, you know, hopefully that changes. And I would imagine that as that changes and grows, I might need to reevaluate that. But that also depends on how, you know, the market changes, perhaps, you know, some of my employees eventually want to be paid in some Bitcoin. So there's, um, I think it's an ever evolving situation. And I'm just keeping my eyes open to that. Um, but I definitely think there's an advantage in keeping, you know, some of our, um, our assets in Bitcoin. For sure. Well, there are plenty of other things we can talk about. You uh, are doing a lot of very interesting things connected to a sovereign lifestyle. I appreciate you sharing today. We're kind of running up against time now. But yeah. do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with the listeners and maybe places you'd like to direct people to go if they want to find out more yeah. about you and what you're doing? Yeah, so you can, um, you know, learn more about me and uh, my practice. I have two locations in Texas, and hopefully we'll have more outside of Texas and um, uh, in the future. That's definitely the goal. But um, my website's ultrapersonal.healthcare. Um, we also have an Instagram and a Facebook, though. I can't say that I'm terribly active on there. Starting to do a lot more blog posting for SEO content. Yep. And um, yeah, just to let people know that there is this option for um, for healthcare. The, 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 you don't have to put up with the traditional um, model and what's you know what's historically been available. There's other options available now. You have the option to employ your provider directly and not have to deal with all the nonsense that comes with um, a healthcare system that has uh, insurance involved. You know, and it's just kind of on a similar vein. I gave birth to four babies at home and, you know, home birth isn't right for everyone, but I want every woman to know that you have the option to have a hospital birth. You have the option mm -hmm. to have a birthing center birth. You have the option to have a home birth and you even have the option to have a baby by yourself in the wilderness if you wanted, you know? Um, uh, so it's just important for me that people know that there are options out there. You just need to know what to look for and you, you need to even know that there's options there. Some people aren't aware of that. So looking at things like crowd health and, 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 and direct primary care practices, concierge medicine. Well, Veronica, I appreciate you sharing all these many things with us today. There's a lot to, to think on here. Uh, wish you the best success in uh, your business as you continue to grow. Thank you for your time today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Josh. It was so good to meet you. Well, friends, it's a wrap. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Business Bitcoinization Show. If you want to reach out to either me or Veronica, you can find those links down in the show notes. If you have the privilege of being in the Austin area, check out Ultra Up Personal Healthcare as well. As always, keep building, keep growing, and until next time, keep living and leading well. If you're a regular listener of the podcast, thank you. If you want to take a further step in your support for the show, you can help us grow by listening on Fountain, a value for value podcast app on iOS or Android. If you hear something you like that you disagree with or anything else, you can share it by sending some sats and adding a comment with your thoughts. Some of you have already done this and I appreciate it. I'm going to begin reading your boosts on upcoming episodes. So if you have some insight or value to add, let the people know. Getting started with Fountain is easy. You can add Bitcoin to your Fountain wallet by using your fiat accounts or any lightning wallet and one of my favorite features is that once you're using the app you can earn sats just by listening on fountain check out the link in the show notes to get started with fountain today